to go to Brian Cham, uh, who is a software developer and designer in Auckland, New Zealand. So he's having a challenging uh, uh, time schedule as well. Uh, he joined NAVA in 2020, and uh, Brian is presenting on the six little known deal breakers of bad flag design. So Brian, over to you. Uh, dear fellow vexillologists, welcome to my presentation. My name is Brian Cham, and I'm a vexillologist from New Zealand. As NAVA members, a lot of us are involved in designing flags or evaluating other flag designs, so it's vital for us to know about good flag design. I've been passionate about flag design for years, and I served on the judging panel for the official flag of NAVA 55 itself. You probably already know about the five principles of good flag design from our famous booklet, Good Flag, Bad Flag. Keep it simple, use meaningful symbolism, use two to three basic colors, no lettering or seals, and be distinctive or related. My presentation goes beyond these principles and discusses the six little known deal breakers of bad flag design. It was originally presented at the interest area meeting in December to positive reception, and I'm honored to be presenting it to a wider audience here at Never 55. To learn something new about flag design, listen up and remember what I'm about to tell you. First, let me explain where these deal breakers come from. In 2015, New Zealand had an official competition to redesign its flag, and there were about 10,000 designs submitted, each with its own set of public commentary. I and another vexillologist, James Fitzmaurice from the United Kingdom, did an exhaustive and impartial survey of the public commentary to uncover the common factors that were associated with public acceptance or public rejection. Our main sources were the government's website where people could upload design suggestions, major news publishers like the New Zealand Herald, One News, News Hub, and stuff.co.nz, and the first page of search engine results for any relevant discussions, rankings, or polls. We used a Java web scraper to extract page content and online comments where possible, but in other cases, we skimmed through it ourselves. If an opinion was serious, specific, and expressed at least three times independently, then we listed and summarized it in Google Docs to find common themes. What did we find from the thematic analysis? Most of the comments regarded political considerations, but we ignored these because we were only interested in the factors behind why the public accepts some designs more than others. Some of them were about particular design elements, like colors, layouts, and symbols, which we did collect, but are outside the scope of this presentation. Some of the comments just confirmed the general principles of flag design that are already described in good flag, bad flag. But other comments revealed some lesser known principles that weren't commonly acknowledged before. These principles are the six deal breakers of bad flag design that I'll explain. I described the analysis to point out that these are not just my opinion. These essentially come from the sum of an entire nation's vexillological commentary across a whole year. So it's completely in touch with the public opinion. In the end, New Zealand's official competition and referendum failed. This is partly because the judges were not vexillologists they were not aware of these deal breakers. The finalist designs all contained these significant flaws, so not many people were satisfied. So the first deal breaker looks like a logo, not a flag. This was by far the most common criticism. Designs were negatively compared to corporate branding or website graphics, because they didn't really look like flags. The public has an expectation of what a flag should look like, which is a simple, timeless, classic style that fits with other flags but actually flying on a flagpole and not just as a flat image. They reject any design that looks too ephemeral, flashy, or trendy. This example is the, was the main official proposal that competed against the national flag and lost. The main criticism was that it looks like slick contemporary branding from a modern marketing department, rather than a flag that follows classic conventions and standards. In vexillological terms, the division of the field is conventionally a stripe. But this design uses the silver fern as both a massive charge and a division of the field at the same time, which breaches this unspoken standard. Whatever the reason, the public figured that this looks really off-putting when it's actually flying on a pole and not just a flat image. And of course, there was the comparison to Kiwi party plates. Second deal breaker, looks like a souvenir, not a flag. This is similar to the first one. Designs can evoke feelings of cringe and contempt if they look too offbeat informal or unflag-like. Even when symbols and colors are meaningful to a culture, they exist on a spectrum from formal to informal. Relying too much on the informal iconography makes the design seem cheesy or just for tourists. 
This finalist was literally just the logo of our tourism department put into a rectangle. This design was already used on the Qualmark logo, the tourism department's official certification scheme. So it's very strongly associated with tourism and souvenirs, which makes the flag look really tacky, even if the symbolism is relevant. A third deal breaker, mystery symbolism. A film critic, Roger Ebert, once said, if you have to ask what it symbolizes, it didn't. He was talking about filmmaking, but it applies to flags as well. It's a problem when designers think of flags as if they're conceptual art projects and try to invent imagery with lofty ideals which require explanations. Even if the explanation has relevance, the designer doesn't have the luxury of explaining the symbolism to every person and they shouldn't need it either. Instead of conceptual art, flag design is more like advertising, which uses the shared visual language already existing in a society to intuitively resonate at first glance. It's not enough for symbolism to be meaningful, it also has to be recognizable. This design was supported by a vocal minority and added to the finalists, but it bombed when presented in the actual referendum. Everyone agreed that while it's simple and it has good symbolism, it only makes sense after it's explained. If you present it to people before you explain it, there's just no resonance. At first glance, the symbolism is as unrecognizable to us New Zealanders as it is to you Americans. So if you're looking at this and you're not sure what it's supposed to mean, that's exactly how we felt as well. The fourth deal breaker, designing for yourself. Some designers act like a flag is a personal art project and they don't need the result to be in touch with general society. They express only their own preferences, appeal to only one sector of society, or just assume that everyone will feel the same way as them. Different themes, colors, and symbols appeal to different people, so it's a mistake to focus on only one theme and exclude all other preferences, which makes symbolism too narrow and is essentially self-sabotage. This example contains green, inspired by nature, and the koru, a symbol from the indigenous Maori culture. The problem is that this design appeals only to those who are both quite strong nature lovers and those who like Maori culture, while ignoring more common personas like those who prefer the familiar symbolism from the current flag or the civil fern. In real life, I've only seen this flag supported by hippie types, while everyone else just thinks it looks like a hippie's personal art project. The fifth deal breaker, too radical. Some designers wipe the slate clean and deliberately aim for revolutionary design with no established symbolism. They think if we're designing a new flag, they'll be designing a new flag. No need for weak-minded half measures or sitting on the fence. They don't value familiarity and reject all existing flags and symbolism as irrelevant. They aim to prescribe a group's identity rather than express it, which is the opposite of how a flag should work. Flags should have a wide appeal to society, so attempting something entirely radical excludes everyone who prefers the familiar imagery that is already embedded in their collective unconscious. This example depicts Matariki, a constellation that's important in the Maori culture. Problem is, using Matariki as a visual symbol is extremely obscure. It doesn't appear on existing logos or graphics, and most of the population couldn't recognize or draw this if prompted. While the constellation itself obviously exists, the idea of using it as a national symbol has no precedent and is essentially a complete invention that exists only in concepts like this, where all other established symbolism gets excluded. And the last deal breaker, it's boring, but it works. This is a really little known deal breaker because guides to good flag design emphasize simplicity. Flags should be simple, simple, simple. But there's actually such a thing as being too simple. Flags should resonate with the public and that means they should be eye-catching, inspirational and memorable. A flag that's too dull will be forgettable and the public will not support it. This example was proposed by a former prime minister she said that if we want a flag that looks less colonial and more independent, we should just remove the Union Jack. The problem is the result contains just the stars and a lot of empty space. Everyone criticized this type of design as a super boring watered down compromise that nobody would ever feel proud to fly. So I've illustrated the six deal breakers with examples from the original context of New Zealand. And just for you all, I've artificially redesigned the American flag badly to illustrate these in a more familiar American context. So here's the first example, and your thoughts are probably, what am I looking at and what does this have to do with America? 
Well, the design is based on the unofficial anthem, America the Beautiful, which describes some of the country's landscape. Spacious skies, amber waves of grain, purple mountain majesties, and fruited plain. It's inspired by other striped flags that represent landscapes, like Estonia, Rwanda, and Ukraine, which is actually praised in the Good Flag, Bad Flag Guide for precisely this reason. This is not to criticize the guide, but rather to point out that a flag could be technically well-designed, but it could still be rejected by the public for other reasons. Superficially, this design satisfies the five principles of good flag design. It's simple. It has relevant meaning. It's only a few colors, no lettering or seals, and it's quite distinctive because of the color scheme. Technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with the way it's constructed. Yet this clearly would not be accepted by society, and the deal breakers can explain why. Mystery symbolism. Without the explanation, it's incomprehensible, and no one would connect it to America. Designing for yourself. I designed this by choosing one theme and deliberately ignoring what anyone else thinks, as if a flag is a personal art project. Too radical. It contains no familiar or established visual iconography. And it's boring, but it works. Tricolor designs are too simple by today's standards. And the second example is more straightforward. The symbolism here is recognizable, but it would also not be accepted, and it demonstrates the other two deal breakers. Looks like a logo, not a flag, and looks like a souvenir, not a flag, which are pretty self-explanatory in this case. By the way, I designed this one to be the direct American equivalent of the official New Zealand finalist flag, which should give you a good idea of why it was poorly received by many people and why the referendum failed. So now that I've explained and illustrated the deal breakers, I'll explain how to avoid them. The main thing is to recognize how important they are. These are deal breakers and not just traps or pitfalls. The public comments didn't just treat these as minor problems, they completely dismissed designs if they detected these deal breakers. You'll want to avoid the deal breakers if you're designing a flag to make sure the design resonates with the public. Or if you're evaluating flags for a competition to avoid any embarrassment if the public rejects the choices because of them. You can prevent them by aiming for the opposite and asking some rhetorical questions. For looks like a logo, not a flag, and looks like a souvenir, not a flag, aim for the opposite, actually looks like a flag. You can ask, does it look good flying on a pole? We usually see flags as flat images, so imagining it on a pole helps to decide if it works as a flag and not just a flat graphic. You can also ask, if someone claimed that this design was not a recent invention and was actually rediscovered in an archive from 50 years ago, would you believe it? If the answer is no, that's a warning sign that the style is too contemporary and flashy. If the answer is yes, that's a good sign that it has a classic and timeless look. For mystery symbolism and too radical, aim for the opposite. Intuitive, recognizable, and familiar. You can ask, would a randomly selected member of the public be able to identify the design and its meaning without any explanation or context? Obviously, it's not always possible for everything in a flag to be understood at first glance, but if there's nothing to latch onto, or if the average person wouldn't even recognize that a design is supposed to be a flag for their location, that's a warning sign that it's not intuitive. And for designing for yourself, aim for the opposite, wide appeal. You can ask, are there any preferences in the public that we're ignoring? This forces you to stop using the aesthetic part of your brain and start using the sympathy part. You can think of some typical personas in society and what each one prefers. Obviously, it won't be possible to please everyone and you shouldn't aim for that. But if you at least consider the other personas, you can detect if a design is too single-minded and has only narrow appeal. And for it's boring, but it works, aim for the opposite, memorable. Go back to the scenario where you ask if a random member of the public could identify the design. Then ask, if you got back to that person 24 hours later and told them it was a secret memory test, would they recall the design? If the answer is no, that's a warning sign that the design is too simple and boring to be remembered. This question is not just hypothetical, as secret memory tests can actually be used during evaluation of flag designs, and I've done this myself. This may not be a scientific process, but it can still give some useful and surprising results. So as a counterexample, James and I designed our own flag for New Zealand. Instead of designing a flag for New Zealand, we aim to design the new flag for New Zealand. We incorporated our analysis of public sentiment and aimed for the opposite of these deal breakers. So we're confident that this design passes all the tests that the other proposals failed 
and would have the highest chance of success. Firstly, it satisfies Neva's five basic principles of good flag design, but it goes beyond these. It actually looks like a flag because we stuck to timeless and classic flag conventions, so it doesn't feel like a logo or souvenir. It's intuitive because it's immediately obvious what it symbolizes at first glance without explanation. The best symbolism is that which doesn't need to be explained. It has wide appeal because it's designed to ensure the highest possible public resonance based on our other statistical evidence of what symbolism resonates with the public, what divides the public, and what the different preferences are. For statistically inclined people out there, we used a multiple linear regression model to maximize expected approval. And it's memorable because we actually did memory testing to evaluate our designs. This one stood out when people saw it, and it stood out when they were secretly asked to recall it days later. So it strikes the perfect balance between simple and interesting. Reflecting on the analysis, there were some limitations and questions that suggest opportunities for future work. Were the original data representative of society? Although we took efforts to be comprehensive, there is a chance that we missed unpublished attitudes. Are there any other insights available from the comments? Unfortunately, we had limited capacity to keep the data. We were only interested in the final result and we never expected to revisit this again years later. So the original data would have to be scraped again. Are certain deal breakers more important than others? Some appeared more commonly than others in the commentary, especially the looks like a logo deal breaker. But this might say more about the design than the public's attitudes. And do these insights generalize across other societies? Anecdotal experience from other flag redesign efforts across the US and Britain suggests that these same themes are shared among other societies but it would be good to confirm this empirically. So when is next time? Redesigning a national flag is an exciting vexillological event. So many have wondered if we'll ever revisit this and I'll answer this with the latest poll from last year. In the first graph, uh, public support for flag change remains low, but the gray area for neutral responses gets wider for each younger generation. So the voting population might gradually become less committed and more open-minded as the time goes on. The second graph shows that changing from a monarchy to a republic is more popular and is already feasible. If that happens, the flag would be revisited as they're seen as related questions. A useful precedent is Australia's uh, republic referendum in the late 90s. That pushed public support for changing their flag to skyrocket from a low 36% to a majority 52%, even though the referendum was unsuccessful and was only about a republic, it didn't concern the flag itself. It probably would have gone even higher if the referendum was successful, and this dynamic would also apply to us. So putting the evidence all together, the flag question probably won't be revisited by itself, but it would piggyback off of a public change when that happens in the future. In conclusion, a comprehensive analysis of the public comments around the New Zealand flag competition revealed six deal breakers that can make or break a flag design in the public consciousness. Even if a flag is technically a good design, the public will still reject it if it looks like a logo or souvenir, if the symbolism is not recognizable, if it has a narrow appeal, if it's not familiar, or if it's just too boring. We should recognize the importance of these deal breakers and prevent them by aiming for the opposites and detecting them when they arise. Ultimately, this is just the beginning. I hope this will open up opportunities to investigate the next level of flag design beyond good flag, bad flag, and use qualitative research to gauge the public vexillological opinion in ways that would not have been possible before. More advanced techniques like data mining and sentiment analysis that weren't available at the time could be used to gain even more insights and further the field of vexillology. For those interested in viewing this and sharing this presentation, I plan to post an online article version to my website where you can also find the blue sky flag. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh... Let's see. Lots of uh, great comments. Uh, if you haven't had a chance, of course, you know, <laughs> while you were given the presentation, if you want to uh, uh, go into the uh, the chat, you'll, you'll see folks were very impressed by uh, bringing the information together that you did and uh, the uh, conclusions and, and the lessons that you learned uh, by doing that. So uh, great stuff there. Okay, here's one. It says, uh, does your own design uh, have a reference to the indigenous population? It does, as a matter of fact. I'll, so it does have uh, some symbolism that's relevant to the Maori people, the indigenous people, um, but it is uh, rather subtle in this design. 
So what we've included is a copious amount of the color red. And that is something that was that's quite significant in their culture. And if you look in the history of the New Zealand flag, uh, well, the current flag that we have isn't actually a first national flag. The first one that we had was back in the early 19th century. And when the British came and they were um, designing a, a flag to use for New Zealand, um, they were consulting with the, the Maori chiefs and their prime uh, request was that their design, whatever they chose for New Zealand had to have a lot of red in it. And they actually rejected some of the other proposals that came out at the time that were uh, almost entirely blue. So by including um, red in this form, especially in the form of a, of a implied mountain, that also references how the land is uh, very important in their culture. Another name they give to themselves is uh, tangata whenua, which means the people of the land. But the way I've included it uh, has references to that cultural importance, but at the same time, it's, it's not so dominant that it excludes anyone else, meaning this mountain it represents everyone, right? It's the landscape, it's the environment, it's, it's for everyone, but it's presented in a way that also has significance to the indigenous culture. So it's kind of like, for ev it represents everyone and it represents the Maori at, at the same time, if that makes sense. Yes, oh, it, it does. Uh, this design, did you do it just for this study, for this presentation, or is that one that you actually came up with and submitted? Uh, it's something that we came up with at the time of the competition. We actually came up with uh, quite a few proposals, but we only decided to uh, enter some of them. And this one was actually not one of the ones that we submitted because the other vexillologist, James, he personally preferred uh, some of the other designs. It's only afterwards, reflecting on the analysis, reflecting on the data and uh, getting feedback in the years after the competition that we actually realize that this one probably is the strongest contender, actually probably has the highest chance of, of public resonance. At, at this point in time, like this is the one that we say, okay, this is probably the design that we were going to go with. But back then, uh, we weren't so sure about it. Gotcha. Okay, so it's serving both purposes then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Question here. Uh, how do you think Helen Clark's proposal would be received if the Southern Cross were placed in the hoist rather than the fly? There were a variety of proposals around sort of idea of just having the Southern Cross in blue. Um, this one is on the fly. Some people moved it to the hoist. Some people put it in the center. The reception was basically the same for all of them. Um, gotcha. It didn't really make much of a difference in terms of uh, public acceptance. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Here's one that says, do you have some evidence for the notion that people expect flag divisions to be lines and not outlines? For example, did it appear in comments? I assume you're referring to my comments around this design where I, I noted that the division of the field is also a charge at the same time. Um, the public comments didn't really go into that much detail about the exact um, design elements or the, they didn't really use vexillological terms. Uh, when I made that comment, that was just my own personal of the reason behind why they felt it looks quite like a logo. The public comments just made the general comment. They just had a general impression that it looks, that doesn't look flag-like for some reason they couldn't really put their finger on. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Results that, that, you, were, that uh, you, you gathered and pulled from and the process that you used, uh, do you think uh, that would be something you could use to see how it would compare in the Mississippi flag process uh, to see if you would come up with something different or, or something that uh, might give maybe, I don't know if that's the right term, revelations or what have you that did not come out uh, during that study? That's a very good question. I sort of touched on this very briefly in one of the questions near the end. Um, does this generalize across other societies? So if I were to replicate this whole analysis for a, a different flag redesign, would I have come up with the same factors? I haven't gone through this comprehensively with any of these other efforts, but just looking through the comments, they do touch on the same general themes. For Mississippi in particular, there might be a bit of an exception for where is it are uh, too radical in the news in the new zealand uh, flag competition people did not want something too radical they wanted something a bit established in the case of mississippi the whole point of redesigning it was to remove the confederate symbolism which was quite uh, controversial and so in that case 
the public when they were redesigning it. As far as I could tell, they specifically wanted it to be radical and not include anything that referenced any of that from the current flag. So that might be something that's different from Mississippi and New Zealand. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you to you for uh, uh, for the effort and uh, presenting the results of, of your efforts uh, at the meeting this year. Uh, the amount of material that you you both went through must have been staggering. Uh, so very well supported uh, uh, with what you brought to us today. Thank you very much for that. Music